Hello. Hey, I think I got some slides, maybe. Um. So yeah, I probably have slides somewhere. If I don't, I can make things up. Um, so I'm GeoHot. Uh, well, I used to go by GeoHot. Uh, you know, I, I came up with that uh, in my high school. I was GeoHot because George Hot. You take the first three letters of the first name and the uh, first three letters of the last name, and you get GeoHot. And you know, when I was 17, uh, my senior year of high school, my, my girlfriend broke up with me. She was the first girl that I really loved. Um, no, it, it's true. And uh, I needed something to, you know, take my mind off of it, right? Um, so fortunately, that same year, Oh, there we go. Uh, fortunately, that same year, the iPhone came out. Um, so the iPhone first came out. It was only available on AT&T in the US. They have a lot of carrier locking for the iPhone. Uh, I had T-Mobile, and I wanted to make the phone work on T-Mobile. This was not out of any sort of practical consideration. I could have bought an AT&T account. It was more about, well, you know, sticking it to the man, right? Do you know what I mean? Like, that's why I do this stuff. Here's Apple. They lock the phone. They say it's on AT&T. How do you stick it to the man and uh, make it work on T-Mobile? So, I press the button, it doesn't go. Oh, okay. Maybe if I hold it like this? Um, so the first unlock of the iPhone was a hardware unlock. You had to open the iPhone up. And the way it worked is the boot ROM in the uh, baseband. There are two processors on the iPhone. There's one processor for the applications and one processor for the cellular radio. I believe this is still true today. Uh, so what you would do was this boot ROM would check for the existence of a bootloader. It would look for this bootloader in these certain addresses, and if the bootloader was there, it would jump to it. And if it wasn't there, it would go into this debug mode where you could upload anything you wanted. So what we did was we erased some other chunk of the flash pulled one of the address lines high, and then when it thought it was reading from the bootloader, it was actually reading from the other chunk of flash, which was empty, and then the phone would go into debug mode. Now, you have to think about, like, I'm 17, and how did I do this, right? How, how was I the first person to, to unlock the iPhone? And to this day, I still kind of don't really know. Um, but, you know, fortunately, it's very motivational when you win. I love, I love winning. I'm a big fan of, of winning. Um, so it, it gave me a lot of motivation to work on the... Is this working, or are you guys just advancing the slides when I hold it up? Okay, no, 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 it works, it works, it works. Funny, it works as long as I hold it here. If I hold it here, it doesn't work, but if I hold it here, it works. Um, so the next unlock was a bootloader unlock. There was a new bootloader that came out, and a very fancy bootloader. Um, if you're ever going to write a bootloader for a device, always make sure that you, I mean, you should really do the same signature checking at download time and runtime, right? Because if you put the signature in there at runtime, the trick with these bootloaders was there was no signature checking at runtime. There was only signature checking at download time. And the downloader had all sorts of bugs. It was way too complicated. Um, so this was the 4.6 bootloader. And then I did a bunch of other jailbreaks. Uh, the rain jailbreaks. Um, and that was kind of it with the iPhone. It was on to the next uh, big challenge. So, you know, the uh, PlayStation had been out for four years. Um, and nobody broke it. Again, it's a challenge, right? These companies spend all this money to make challenges for me to solve. Uh, the PlayStation 3 had a hypervisor. And it actually, back in the day, would run Linux. Um, today, Sony has removed the Linux feature. But if you used it, they owe you $55. Um, because removing it was, well, illegal, but they didn't put it back. It's, it's, the hypervisor basically sat above both the game kernel and the Linux kernel. And it was very good code because it wasn't written by Sony, it was written by IBM. So the only real way to get into the hypervisor, there probably wasn't a, even, there might have been, but the software was good because this was designed by IBM to work in data centers. And for every line of code IBM writes, they probably write 10 lines of documentation about why that code is secure. Uh, so the hypervisor, the way I ended up breaking it, was by glitching the physical memory. 
right? So you have page tables in a CPU, and there's hyper calls, which is like the you know hypervisor version of a syscall, uh, which you could call into, and you could make modifications to the uh, to the page tables. And if you made certain modifications to the page tables, when you released a page of memory, it had to remove all of the entries you added. But if you glitched the memory at the exact second that you did that, the page table write back would fail, and you'd have a page table pointing to uninitialized parts of memory, and you could privesk that to get a whole lot more. A um, bunch of time went by. Uh, these guys fail overflow, discovered that you could uh, rederive the private key if you could get two pairs of um, basically these loaders, right? Uh, and you could do this for like the kernel and stuff, but I wanted to get the highest level key. So I found an exploit in the met loader, um, grabbed two loaders with the met loader, used the fail overflow trick, and got the full root key for the PlayStation 3. Uh, Sony was not very happy about this, and I ended up getting sued. Um, Who would you rather be today, Sony or Apple? I mean, Apple was very nice to me the whole time I was jailbreaking. Sony, not so much. Uh, but yeah, so these were we like they, these weren't what people traditionally considered, you know, straight up hacking. They were devices, right? So let's move on to the real thing. How do you attack web browsers, right? Like web browsers, are these these supposedly impenetrable, super complex. Um, my first year at Pwn to Own, I went for a web browser light. I did Adobe Reader. Uh, Adobe Reader, the PDF Reader, actually. Similar in a web, to a web browser in a lot of ways. Um, the exploit that I used for the first stage was, a, it wasn't even a zero day. It was a one day because Adobe Reader used an old version of SpiderMonkey, which is uh, the Firefox JavaScript engine. So I found an exploit in the Firefox JavaScript engine in about three days. And then I found out that Adobe Reader uses a sandbox. And the sandbox that Adobe Reader uses is the Google Chrome sandbox. Uh, which is really a, a very great sandbox. Um, there's a few ways to attack it, but fortunately, Adobe added their own calls to the sandbox, and there were clever bugs in the Adobe code. Um, there was basically a handle double free, and like a Windows handle, a double free, um, that you could trigger by making this hyper call, so I would free, um, a handle and get a different handle to land in, basically get the thread handle to land in the double free handled spot. And then when it would try to dupe that handle back to me, I ended up getting a thread handle. And when you have a thread handle in Windows, you can do uh, whatever you want to that thread. Um, so that was the Adobe Reader sandbox break. I came back next year really ready to win big at Pwn to Own. And I did a full stack uh, root on the Chromebook but you can go download. It's, it's, pretty, it's pretty good code if you want to see what a modern exploit looks like. Um, full, I think, still the only person ever to get a persistent root on the Google Chromebook. Uh, it took me about five weeks. And I had two days uh, before the competition to spare. So I targeted Firefox, and I got it in 24 hours. Um, Firefox security is a joke. Uh, so yeah, that was Ponta on. Uh, another thing that I did around this time, too, was uh, CTFs. Um, I was on PPP for the last four years at DEF CON. We won three out of the four years. Um, the one year that I did not, uh, that we did not win, I showed up a day late, and we got second place. So maybe if I had showed up the first day, we would have gotten first place, but hey. Um, you know, and uh, to really prove that you're the best, and that's what this is all about, you don't just have to be able to do it as a team. You have to be able to do it solo. Uh, 2014, I won Secu Inside alone um, as, as Tom Cruise, my uh, CTF playing alter ego with blonde hair. Uh, there's an interview of me talking about bagels. It's a good interview. Um, but yeah, why do this stuff, right? This is a movie, SLC Punk. That's kind of how I saw myself, right? You're, you're like up against these corporations, and you're like, again, they, make, they spend a lot of money to make these puzzles for me to solve, and it's kind of great to stick it to them. But I've been doing this for 10 years now. It's time to grow up. Companies spend millions of dollars 
to make puzzles for me to solve, but they're getting too easy. You know what I mean? Like, it's really, it's all too easy. What has really changed in security in the last, um, in the last 10 years? And, you know, where I really talk about this, and I'm, I'm shocked at how bad it still is, is tools, right? I'm still using the exact same IDA that I was using 10 years ago. And it's, it's, just, it's just tedium and frustrating to do a lot of these binary exploits. Um, also, there's been a trend in security, which is great from a attacker perspective, uh, which is great from a defender perspective, but terribly annoying from an attacker perspective, which is to add more levels of sandboxing and encapsulation, and you know now like to go from root to kernel. There's a security boundary there. You're putting apps in sandboxes. You look at think of the iPhone browser, right? You're in like, okay, the Safari context, you have to jailbreak the Safari sandbox, then the app sandbox, then the kernel, san and then, then to get to root, and then the kernel sandbox. And it's just, it's just so many steps, and it's, it's tedium. So, so what do you do, right? What's next? Where else are there puzzles? Where can we go beyond the puzzles that the companies made for me to solve? Let's go to nature. Let's hack nature itself, right? I mean, I believe that I'm a computer. Like, I really believe this. And we should be able to, well, hack me, right? And how do you, how do you go about this? I mean, you, you, you think about what the brain is, and it's, I mean, it's fancy. The brain is pretty fancy. But it's not beyond. You know, the brain is about 100 billion neurons or something. That's not that much. 100 trillion synapses? So if you're storing them as like 8-bit floats, I mean, that's what, 100 terabytes? It's not that much. I got a server in my closet that has more storage than that, right? It's finally time to move on and target the really big things. Um, so I worked at an artificial intelligence research lab for about six months. Um, research isn't really for me. I like doing things. I like getting my hands dirty. So a few months later, I bought a car, and I made it drive itself. Um, so this was the beginning of, uh, well, so this is, this is basically what the car was. And the way this worked was, um, so these, a lot of modern cars have these advanced driver assistance systems. Um, they allow the brakes and the steering wheel to be controlled electronically to some extent. Uh, they're called like adaptive cruise control on cars, which is cruise control that can hit not only the gas, but also the brake. Lane keeping assist will keep you in your lane. Um, these were controlled by this little camera module on the car, so I ripped out the camera module, uh, figured out what CAN messages were being sent, and um, you can see over there, uh, my glove compartment there, I have a CAN transceiver module, which is basically just sending the exact same message that the camera module used to send to control the brakes and steering wheel of the car. I mounted a 21.5 inch touchscreen in there, it's 4.5 inches bigger than Tesla. Um, yeah, you know, it runs Ubuntu. The whole car is written in Python. All right, so you build a self-driving car, now what do you do? Well, I watched a television show, and the television show made starting a startup look cool. Uh, take it from someone who's done it, it's not. If you take one piece of advice away from my talk, don't start a company. Um, but I did, and it's called Comma AI. Uh, we got investment from uh, a big venture capital firm in Silicon Valley, and. Um, then what do we do? Well, in order to really teach a car how to drive, you need lots and lots of data. So how do you gather lots and lots of data? Well, if you can do it with a phone app, it's great, because everyone has smartphones, right? So we wrote two phone apps, one for iPhone, one for Android. Um, basically, you mount your smartphone up on your windshield, and it sends back the camera data the GPS data, the accelerometer data, which we use to reconstruct the path your car took. And then we learn a model, given a picture, predict where the car should go in this scenario. And we don't have to hand label anything. It's all automatically ground truth because we have the path the car actually took. Most drivers are, by definition, good drivers, right? I mean, if they were not, well, maybe their phone wouldn't have lived to upload the data to me. Um, so, hey, it's like natural selection, you know what I mean? I guess the really bad data would never make it back. Um, but yeah, so we gathered 
almost uh, half, a million, uh, half a million miles of driving data. This is about double what Mobileye has, maybe a quarter of what Google has. Tesla has a whole lot more, but remember, they don't actually get the video back. So we're getting the video back from all of these. We put these into a huge machine learning algorithm, and now we have a car that drives pretty well. What do we do? Figure out how to ship it to everybody. So this is the comma one. I mean, I see these things are pretty popular in China, these smart rear view mirrors, like these, um, I saw the, my driver who picked me up in the airport had one of these things. Cute, like little Android running rear view mirrors. Um, now these ones obviously don't uh, drive cars. Um, but this is the comma one, and I have one here today. Wow, this is uh, the first time. This is a comma one V2. Um, this is a whole lot closer to the one that will actually ship. Basically what you do is you take this thing, you remove the rear view mirror from your car. Um, this connector here connects to where the old camera unit on your car used to be. Um, this is basically just on the car's CAN bus. It has power. Um, so you mount this up, replace your rear view mirror with it, and this thing will run and actually drive your car. It's very similar to Tesla Autopilot, um, but it's aftermarket and it works on cars that cost $20,000, not $100,000. Um, our slogan at Kama AI is ghost riding for the masses. So, yeah, Kama ones. Um, yeah, so this is, this is the Kama one. Uh, it drives a car and it will be available by the end of this year for $999 plus $24 a month subscription fee. Um, and I guess this is kind of a product pitch. I don't think I was supposed to do a product pitch. I'm confused about what I was supposed to do. But, so there we go. And here, you know, it's weird. It's weird. Uh, I, I didn't think, like, if you asked me even like three years ago, if I'd be a startup CEO and, and, and doing this, and you know, you know, comment, it's not just me. This is made by seven people. Um, we have a great team, really world-class talent. Um, and yeah, we're trying to ship and we're trying to, I mean, it's the same game, right? It's the same game, like, what do they used to do to Apple? Let's use very few lines of code and a whole lot of cleverness to make the iPhone do more than it could out of the box. What was the PS3? It was the same thing. Let's use very few lines of code and a whole lot of cleverness to make the PS3 do more than it could do out of the box. And I mean, now let's move on to something bigger, right? Smartphones and video games are, are cute, but like cars? This is, this is potentially a, you know, multi-billion dollar industry. Uh, I mean, I guess smartphones and video games are multi-billion dollar industries too, but uh, in a different sort of way, right? Like, this is also a potential path to AI, right? Imagine having this huge network of cars out there collecting data about the real world and all learning from each other. Every comma one has an LTE radio in it. This LTE radio sends all of the data that it collects back to the cloud where it's processed by our machine learning algorithms, where it's condensed down into a model, and then this model is sent out to the comma ones. They are literally all, once we launch them at the end of the year, going to be learning from each other, right? And like like in a very serious way, right? Maybe all the Furbies learn from each other too, but I mean, this is really, I think, how you start to uh, take a stab at uh, the huge problems in artificial intelligence, right? You take massive, massive amounts of data. As learning algorithms get better, you'll need less data, but you know, for now we have not the best learning algorithms. Also, when you look, when you, look, when you compare a human to the artificial neural networks of today, um, you're off by like a, a factor of a million. Right? The artificial neural networks, just from a hardware perspective, are a whole lot weaker. But even with the much weaker, I mean, algorithms, we can, I think, do at least everything a human can do while driving a car unconsciously. Once you get into the more conscious behaviors, um, it's unclear if modern artificial intelligence has really solved that problem yet. But, I mean, that's the adventure, right? So, yeah. I'm George Hotz. I used to play a character named GeoHot on the internet. Now I play a startup CEO of Kama AI. And that's my talk. Hold on. George?
Uh, I have some questions. Yeah, 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 cool. That was thought that he's clear to make an advertisement. I would like to ask some questions for the audience. Before he come here, we define him as uh, a uh, grassroots expert. He can hack so many things. That is remarkable, and he's a great scientist. So he's capable of hack so many things. How would you see your achievement as hacking nature comparing to other people doing AI? How do you see your achievements? As a hacker, was capable of target so many things. I think we can completely hack. How do you think that? And I think that if you look at history, that's kind of what it's been a progression of. I think in the future we will be able to do things literally beyond what we're capable of conceiving of right now. I think that building things that are super intelligent is possible and will happen in my lifetime. And I'm very excited about. The role I can play, and I mean, what it's all going to look like, right? We live in a very exciting time, and I mean, I'm very excited about it. Um, so, what do I think? It's possible. I'm a naturalist. I believe that I'm a machine, and I believe that I can build better machines than myself. Um, how do I evaluate my work? Well, I mean. So it's going to be, it's, this is not going to be solved in five years. Um, self-driving cars might be. So self-driving cars, like a lot of people say about AI, um, that AI in some ways is almost defini definitionally what we haven't solved yet, right? Remember when people in the 50s thought chess was AI? And then, you know, humans lost to computers at chess and oh, that was, that's just search, right? And then people thought, well, Jeopardy was AI because of the nuance of language. And then humans lost to computers at Jeopardy. And oh, well, you know, that's just big data. And, uh, but they'll never be able to understand the subtlety of something like Go. You know, perception is AI complete. And now with deep neural networks, Go has fallen. Classification has fallen. Like, things will start to fall one at a time. Um, I think self-driving cars is one of the next potentially really big ones. And that's why I'm here, and that's why I'm doing this. But yeah, how do I evaluate it? Once comma ones are driving people's cars, it would be a success. OK. How do you think the security of your product, anyone can hack it? I mean, you can try. Um, <laughs> you, no, seriously, you can try. Uh, I'll be impressed. Um, it's, it's decent. Uh, so the comma one, unfortunately, does run Android. <laughs> um, parts of Android. A lot of it's been ripped out. Um, if you want, it uses a Qualcomm Snapdragon 820, and if you're running a Snapdragon 820, you pretty much don't have a choice. You have to run Android. Um, I don't know. It's pretty good security. It's all HTTPS. Uh, try. Send me a bug report. I'll be impressed if someone breaks it. Maybe your product me will be our target in the next year. <laughs> 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 so actually, for him, for George, he has done something other people cannot achieve. Hacking into nature, I had some thoughts before as well. AI has been developing for so many years, over six decades, but we are still zero to zero point something, never into one. If we want to make a solid breakthrough, we can only rely on the innovative hackers. I do want to know what is draw hot expectations towards AI in the future. You hack into the brains. What do you foresee AI to be? So how sophisticated your hacking can be in the future? Um, so, I don't think that far in advance. 
Um, my plan for the next year is to ship these, ship a lot of these, and then start to really uh, uh, work on some of the, you know, making the algorithm better, right? I don't think that AI, I don't think there's going to be some magic breakthrough that just happens. I think it's going to be a lot of hard work. I mean, I think it's going to be the defining computer science problem, maybe the defining problem of our generation. Um, am I going to pwn more things? Maybe if I get bored on a weekend. Uh, maybe. I don't know. The glory that it once had for me, it doesn't, I don't really, I don't really feel it anymore. I don't know. It's, 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 maybe when something comes out that's really challenging. Um, maybe when people get actually good at security and people think things are unbreakable. Everyone knows everything's breakable today. I proved my point. Thanks. Thank you. I just found his badge is calm. It's very bright for. What about yours? Mine is quite dark. I don't know. I don't know. I just put it on. No. Well, anyway, thank you again to George Hodge for sharing. And thank you for the presentation. We need to hurry up because we are very much delayed the schedule. So any questions, please talk offline. Don't forget to have the signed draw hot t-shirts. Don't forget that we will have a lucky draw later. Coming to the next session, it is relevant to draw hot as well. Prior to him, no one has broken iPhone. No one has broken PlayStations. But the next session will be two young men from China trying to break PS4. Let's see, can they do it or not? Now let's have uh, two of our uh, young men, Yang Kun and Sleeper. 